Welcome to uh, CDI's first masterclass on urban resilience. We are glad and delighted that you all can join us in this uh, four session, six weeks masterclass. Of course, uh, this masterclass is a part of CDRI's annual uh, global flagship conference, and which is held on 17th to 19th of March. We really hope that all of y'all can join us at the conference itself. Uh, it's a virtual conference and uh, I'll post the link on the chat box. I just have one clear instruction. If when you all uh, type your questions on the, Q, uh, on the Q and A box, if you can type your name, but also in brackets mention your city as well as your country, then uh, the speaker will uh, answer in a more contextual way. And uh, I, without taking any more time, I hand over the screen to Mr. Sandeep Pondrick, the DG of the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. Sandeep, sir. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Priya. And uh, let me first welcome all the part participants of this masterclass from uh, many countries who have re uh, registered for this uh, series of master uh, classes. The first we are organizing today in uh, collaboration with uh, IIHS, the Indian Institute of Human Settlements. Uh, so uh, it is my privilege to welcome uh, Aruma Revi, who is the director of the Indian Institute for Human Settlements, which is India's uh, prominent institution of eminence and interdisciplinary national university focused uh, mainly on urbanization. He's a global practice and thought leader and educator with over 35 years of experience in sustainable development, public policy and governance, human settlements, urban issues, and uh, environmental and technological change. Arumar is the co-chair of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, the SDSN, from where, uh, where he has helped lead a successful global campaign for an urban sustainable development goal, uh, which is SDG 11, as part of UN's 2030 development agenda. He is one of the South Asia's most experienced risk and disaster management professionals and has been on the advisory board of UNDRR Scientific and Technical Advisory Group, the STAG, and its biannual global assessment of risk since 2008. So uh, without taking any much time, any more time, I will now hand over the floor to Arumar to start the class and take it forward. Over to you, Arum. Thank you, Sandeep. It's a pleasure to have you here. I'm going to try and share my screen just now so that we are able to get up and going. Good. Um, I'm assuming now that most people can can see the screen. Is that okay, Priya? Are we good to go? Can we see? Good Great. to go. Yeah, good to go. So it's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, uh, just as a you know, quick introduction, Sandeep sort of laid out where I, I'm coming from. But in, in today's context, uh, my own work uh, over the last many decades, let's say, has been at the intersection between sustainable development, um, risk, uh, especially disaster risk reduction, and uh, and climate. And what I'm going to try today is to to bring you know all three of them together in an urban context, uh, of course. You know, since you, most of you come from different parts of the world, I'm going to try and keep it relatively simple. But in the question and answer, we can actually try and contextualize it because I do have a little bit of experience uh, having worked across whatever it is, 60 odd countries and, and, and pretty much all, all the continents in the world. So we'll try and kind of contextualize it as best as we can uh, to try and respond to the questions that we have. So what are we going to be doing today? I'll you know, try and take you through a set of maybe six or seven questions. We'll try and look at why cities and urban systems are important. We'll try and understand what urban resilience is and why it is important within the context of development uh, over the next few decades at least. What are the key infrastructure systems that we see in cities? Because they're absolutely critical to making cities what they are. And that's you know, one of the critical elements of trying to enable resilience. How can we implement the sustainable development goals, which I guess some of you are familiar with. Maybe I'll take a little time to explain what they are and how they work. They're a global framework, but we have to localize them. 
and how do we implement disaster risk reduction in urban areas, especially in relationship to these development goals? And then, of course, something that is a very critical question for us, both now and certainly in the future, is how can we accelerate and deepen climate action in cities? Because CDRI is trying to uh, bring together not only questions of uh, sort of dealing with disaster risk uh, reduction and resilience, but also uh, sort of climate resilience because they are very closely tied together. And then finally, this seems like a complex agenda, but how can we fairly simply think about and, and, and look at implementation, which in some senses is probably easier uh, in an urban context than in, uh, in, in, other, you know, in other larger sort of forms of aggregation where it's a little difficult to work uh, cross-sectorally. So I guess, uh, you know, the whole story here is uh, that cities have actually become very dramatically important. And of course, we know that the 21st century is a century which is kind of going to be dominated by urbanization. Uh, somewhere in the, in the 2010s, we went to a world that was at least half urban in terms of population. But what most people don't know is starting, I would say in the 1990s, we have rough estimates of it, the global economy had actually gone uh, urban maybe at least a decade or a decade and a half before that. So you're having a global economy that's predominantly driven by urban processes. We have most people living in urban areas. And of course, the thing is, this is happening because cities actually concentrate opportunities. Their economies of scale, which basically means that when you put together infrastructure, when you put, put together economic activities in cities, they're much more effective than when they're distributed across, uh, you know, in, 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 in much larger spaces in countries that are uh, still like like India, for example, significantly rural. So they're economies of scale, but they're also economies of scope. Then network impacts that are there, especially because of ICT, because of innovation that makes cities extremely productive places. And that's why you have so much of employment, so much of economic activity. Uh, you know, more than two thirds of the world economy actually is driven by 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 urbanization, uh, or in certainly in urban centers. And this is not only in large urban centers in the mega cities of the world, uh, the Mumbai's, the Shanghai's, the New York's, um, the uh, Johannesburg's of the world, but most critically at the moment, the opportunity lies in mid-sized places in what we call secondary towns, where the bulk of people are and will continue to live as we start to urbanize across the world. So in some senses, cities are, have been so successful in the last century or so, starting from a, from a humble beginning. So in 1950s, just after the Second World War, as the UN was created, the global urban population is about you know, 750 million people. And the size of the global economy and let's say constant prices was about $3 trillion. And you can see where the urban centers are. Uh, a lot of them are in Europe, uh, in North America, uh, you know, fair amount of stuff is starting to happen uh, in, in, in Latin America. And of course, Asia historically has had a strong sort of urban footprint even before the process of industrialization and colonization started in the uh, 18th and the 19th century. And then, of course, the interesting thing is cities have grown tremendously. They grew and grew over uh, the 19th, but particularly over the 20th century. And then if you, you know, fast forward uh, 60 years later to 2010, you move from a population uh, of, like I said earlier, about 0.3 billion to about 2.9 billion people in urban areas. And you can see the urban footprint is dramatically shifting across the world, of course, growing uh, very critically in Latin America, in, in Europe and North America, but also massively in Asia. And you can see that with the you know, Chinese, Japanese, and then South Asian uh, urbanization. And also in many parts of Africa, you can see Nigeria coming up quite extensively. Also some areas in uh, in, in, the, in the Gulf and, and the Middle East. But the most important thing is not necessarily the population, it's actually the economic size. And this is the reason why urban resilience is very important. We can see the impact of, let's say, something that like, like COVID, which started you know, in, in a mid-size um, city in, in China and then essentially has knocked down uh, not only national but the global economy over the last year. So you can see the impact of hazards or risks in this particular case, it just happened to be a health hazard, but there could be other things that, that have dramatic impact. And you know, like health, climate is something that will affect everything across the world. So we need to look at, uh, look at, look at sort of resilience in, in, mul in, in multiple dimensions. And these are just two that are, that are kind of interesting to look at. And of course, cities became dramatically aspirational. This is of course, uh, an image that comes from Singapore, which is an aspirational city for many people in, uh, in Asia and other parts of the world. Uh, that really made, a, made its way over about 30 years or so from, from being a fairly, let's say, I would say a low middle income country to one that's a high income country. Of course, Singapore 
can hardly be reproduced in most parts of the world. It's a singularity. It's a very, very particular location that's there, but the aspiration is strong. And you know what the question of course is, uh, in some senses, cities have then proceeded to conquer the planet. The projections for 2030, and this is the really interesting thing is, you know, 2030s, I guess we will have, a, you know, urban pop, a, a global population of just over 8 billion of that about 5 billion or so uh, will be uh, in urban areas. And you can see in a sense, the world is filled with cities of all shapes and sizes, excepting for, of course, some inhospitable environments uh, towards the poles in, in, in parts of, of Australasia. But apart from the population, the key thing, of course, to remember here is we, we will go from 2010 from a $30 trillion urban economy to a $90 trillion economy. So when we're talking about resilience, we're talking about resilience, not only in terms of physical infrastructure, we're talking about resilience in terms of economic and social processes, because uh, the bulk of this incremental urbanization is happening uh, in Asia, in South Asia in particular, in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, and these are countries which are in, you know, in, in dramatic process of transition, but they're countries which have a large numbers of poor people, especially concentrated in urban areas, who are highly vulnerable to a whole range of shocks, whether it's economic shocks, health shocks like COVID, um, or of course, uh, natural disasters that have, you know, come, come and, and gone many times. Actually, many of them, in some senses, are not really natural. Uh, they are sort of underscored by the vulnerability of these populations. So. Of course, this urbanization is, has created tremendous opportunities. Uh, China has just announced that it has basically moved everybody uh, you know, above its own uh, sort of extreme poverty line, which is one of the most dramatic development stories that we've seen over the last uh, two or three decades. Uh, and that is starting to happen in many other parts of the world. Uh, but they are unintended and, and pretty nasty unintended consequences. You know, I'm just showing you a, an image of sulfur dioxide emissions across the world. This, as you can see, and you can see the point locations, is driven by urbanization, by industrialization, and things that, in a, in a sense, they map very closely with urban centers across the world. So, you know, we're creating massive environmental impact, apart from a whole range of other social and other, and other questions that need to be addressed uh, when we're looking at questions of urban res resilience. It's not only a question of, you know, how, how do I deal with the ne next typhoon or cyclone or hurricane, depending on which part of the world you are, or how am I going to deal with drought, or what happens when you have an earthquake that, let's say, for example, hit Nepal not so many years ago, uh, or uh, when there's an extreme flooding event that impacted Bangkok, or an extreme sort of weather event that hit uh, cities like um, like New York, uh, you know, not so long ago, and and you can see that pretty much in in, in every in in every continent. So the question, I guess, is to put it very simply, and this is kind of a heterodox way of looking at it because you know people define it in various various different ways, but because I think uh, many of us are working in urban contexts, which are rapidly changing. Like I said, the bulk of the addition to urban areas are going to be in the global south, especially um, in, in Africa, in Asia, uh, and also in, in small island development states. Many of these countries are low, uh, uh, you know, low income countries. Some of them are low to middle income uh, countries who really struggle to try and do this. So, so, you know, when I look at urban residents, basically what we're saying is we're trying to build the capacity of cities to function so that the people living and working in them, especially the poor and the vulnerable, survive and thrive no matter what stresses or shocks they encounter. Now, this is kind of, you know, people look at it in different ways, but I think if we take a, a frame which the, the, the UN's uh, 2030 agenda has taken, which basically puts the poor and the vulnerable uh, uh, first in some senses, then I think the, the context of urban resilience becomes a little bit different. You're not going to you know, harden high-end infrastructures, which of course are important, but primarily look at trying to reduce vulnerability to raise the level of living conditions of working conditions of lifeline services uh, and make that universal. So the, the critical thing here, of course, is a question of survival, because in many cases, um, most of these shocks that we're seeing is threatening survival. COVID, of course, is the most obvious one that's there, but you know, every time a, a city or an urban area is hit, hit by uh, an extreme weather event or by an earthquake in other cases, um, or in some cases, uh, you know, uh, a tsunami, uh, as, as we saw in the Indian Ocean tsunami, the people who are most dramatically impacted are the poor and the vulnerable because they often stay in the places uh, that are the most vulnerable in the city. So. You know, that's a key thing that's there. And with the, the issue here is not only one kind of shock, you know, you can try and increase um, the resilience of let's say an urban system or buildings to an earthquake. But then if you forget about the fact that they may be impacted by, by a cyclone or a typhoon, or uh, they may be, uh, you know, 
a storm surge induced kind of impact that you see, which then impacts city, uh, the city itself or the areas around it and, and drowns a large number of people, we're kind of missing the boat in some senses. So the thing about resilience is it's not about a particular, you know, particular element we're talking about. It's not only trying to, like I said, strengthen the walls against an earthquake or, or trying to deal with drought and make sure that, you know, that you have enough water in, in spite of an extended period of drought. It's about enhancing the performance of the entire system. And the important thing to understand here that is that cities are systems of systems. Um, so if the cities are composed of many things, of course, centrally, they're all about people uh, and people are involved in a whole range of other economic and social activities, but they sit inside a matrix which has many different elements. You know, we live and work in buildings by and large, uh, but we have a whole range of other infrastructures that enable the city to work. And, and it's only when these infrastructures work seamlessly uh, that you would actually have improvements in development and everybody has access to what, you know, in some senses we've agreed uh, should happen in the sustainable development goals. Uh, the fact that everybody should have access to clean water and sanitation, uh, universal access to clean energy, and of course, you know, good health and, and, and universal education. So basically, we, we are trying to, to, to improve the performance of the entire system in the face of multiple hazards. Now, why is the hazard story important? It's important because, you know, when I showed you this, the, 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 let's say, about a, about a century ago, the, the global population was about a billion, a little, little bit over a billion and a half people. We're now at, at, at 8 billion plus, and we have, in some cases, very large national populations, which themselves are over a billion. Right? And so the world now is full of people, and those people are pretty much everywhere, excepting in the most inhospitable kind of terrains. And we have cities and places where, in some senses, they were unthinkable um, you know, maybe 50 or 100 years ago, if you look at a city like Mexico City or the place that I'm sitting in at the moment, Bangalore, these are cities or Addis Ababa, they're cities that sit in plateaus, which basically means that they have no access to water. They have to draw water from, you know, sometimes uh, many hundreds of kilometers away and they have to lift them, uh, sometimes in the case of Bangalore, almost a kilometer. So these are places which are, which happen because of the kind of technologies we had, the fact that we have a lot of free energy to work and, and things like that. So basically there are people everywhere and because of the fact that there are people everywhere and a lot of urbanization is now in what we call the low elevation coastal zone, which is you know very close to coasts or along shorelines and next to rivers because you know water is a critical factor in, in urbanization, both historically and at the current point of time, they're at high risk, you know, because climate is changing, the whole range of other processes that are in place and this is going to make things you know somewhat 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 difficult or effective so we have to look holistically at a whole range of dis different hazards and i'll just go over them very quickly uh, and then we have to respond to them in a way that's appropriate to that particular location because you know risk and resilience are very context specific i mean there's some broad principles that you that are useful but the real key story here is how does one deal with context and how does one deal with context in, let's say, 10,000 places across the world? I mean, in India, for example, we have about 650,000 uh, uh, villages, uh, but we have something of the order of eight to 9,000 odd urban centers. Uh, but these urban centers produce uh, almost two thirds, uh, close to two thirds just now, of our economic activity. So we do need to look at them <coughs> as places which are very important in trying to you know, address both economic and social and environmental challenges. Now, you know, as a sort of mnemonic for you, these cities need to have, you know, five or six things that are important. They need to be able to reflect on themselves because, you know, things are always changing. They need to be robust, obviously, to deal with the shocks. They need to have redundancy, which is something that is, is a bit of an issue when we're dealing with development questions, because in many parts or most parts of the world, uh, resources are very scarce. So, you know, even if you go to the United States, or in Europe, but certainly the United States, there's a massive trillion dollar infrastructure deficit. So if you're talking about redundancy, it seems like you know an odd kind of things to say. Infrastructure is not in a good shape in the first place. How can we talk about redundant infrastructure? You need to have resources, of course, to make this happen, which means that we have to rethink how we finance these processes where the resources can be raised from, where they come from the public system, from communities, uh, from, from, from the private sector. They, of course, need to be flexible. And what we're seeing is because people are so central to this and their vulnerabilities are very critical, they, these systems have to be, they absolutely have to be inclusive because your greatest loss often happens, especially of life, uh, because, uh, you know, 
people are excluded from access to services. They're excluded from, uh, from places which are actually safe. And, and at the end of it, all of these things have to be brought together. So it seems like you know, a complex and difficult thing to do, but I'm gonna try and show you very quickly how these kind of things can be thought about. So just to deal, deal with it you know, very simply, uh, this is a laundry list. You know, don't, don't get confused by what, what there's on screen. You can see it later. There, you know, there are about 10 different systems or infrastructure systems that, that underpin most cities across the world. Of course, there are multiple, you know, especially in cities in the global south, many of these systems are informal. They don't necessarily work. They work in other places because we never have enough resources to be able to, uh, to try and, you know, and, and try and finance these things. So what are the critical things? And you might be a little surprised here because I've started with something which is not necessarily seen as an infrastructure, but is absolutely critical for what we need in, in most cities. Uh, and that is what we call ecosystem services. I mean, the basic fact is that most urban areas do not produce their own food. They rarely produce their water. I mean, some places you can draw water from groundwater in some senses. Uh, there are severe problems of air pollution, like I've showed you just now, the sulfur dioxide emissions or carbon dioxide, et cetera, in many parts of the world, especially those that are growing rapidly. And of course, what we're seeing is that biodiversity is a very important question. There's a recent report that is, that, that's been brought out by Parthas Asgupta and other um, colleagues from the UK, which really looks at the cost of biodiversity loss. And you know, urban areas have are both part of the problem, but also in some senses, part of the solution. So cities cannot survive without these ecosystem-based services, you know, because they don't produce their own food, they don't have enough water. And of course, if air quality is bad, like we're seeing in many parts of Asia, then lots of people, both young and old and others who have comorbidities uh, are really at risk and many of them die at, at, at high cost. So the fundamental thing, and you know, people talk about this in terms of nature-based solutions is cities cannot survive without the areas around them, uh, without the integration of, of green and blue, depending on where they are, that is forests and, and water. And, and in a sense, and that's why I've laid out these SDGs there, SDG two is about food security, 14 and 15 about, are about life uh, above land and below water. They're critical to sort of enabling cities to manage uh, their own lives and, and, and do what they need to do. And then of course, critical infrastructure and water, and I put wastewater in brackets because in most parts of the world, uh, there's almost no space now for wastewater. We have to be able to treat it ecologically. Otherwise we need to recycle it. And of course, drainage, because as climate changes start, start becoming much sharper, we will have both drought and flooding in the same places. The regime of rainfall in its intensity and its location is going to change in many, many parts of the world as temperatures change, because it's very simple. You know, the, the atmosphere has much, uh, I mean, there's, there's more, um, more water vapor in the atmosphere. It, it can't be contained. There'll be more rain in some senses. Waste management is a very critical thing. We have actually destroying the planet. You can pretty much go to even the remotest parts of the world and you can see plastics and a whole range of anthropogenic waste that are there. And of course, in many parts of the world, you can see massive landfills or mountains of waste that we have to deal with. And this is an important and critical question. We don't often think of waste as something that's, that's related to critical infrastructure. But the fact is, if we don't deal with the waste, then all the wonderful other things that we have are actually not much use because that's a, that's a space that really makes living in cities difficult. So this is a whole range of questions about, you know, what we call sustainable production and consumption, reconstructing how we think about how we use and produce things. And then the most obvious and critical infrastructures, clean energy infrastructures, because without energy, cities can't run. That's a key driver of urbanization in some senses. Mobility infrastructures of various shapes and sizes, from rail to road to air to ports, uh, which are critical to keeping cities alive and keeping you know, economic activity, trade and, and manufacturing growing, global supply chains are critical, critically related to mobility infrastructures. You can see what has happened when there's a breakdown in some places. You know, if there's an earthquake in, in, in some parts of, of the world, you'll suddenly see that their supply chains disrupted for computers. Uh, if there's flooding that happened in Bangkok, for example, supply chains for a whole range of different uh, manufactured goods actually got disrupted. And then something that's kind of new that has happened over the last uh, two or three decades or so, uh, a global and certainly hyperlocal ICT and I IoT infrastructures that are there. So this is the internet, this is telephony, and you know, now it's almost impossible, I think, for many young people in the world to imagine a world in which you don't have at least 3, 4, 3G, 4G, and potentially 5G. And as the internet of things takes over, this is gonna be something that's gonna change the lives of a large number of people, uh, including in, in places that are relatively poor and, and let's say that have a lot of informality. And of course, other things, you know, 
All of this sits within an environment in which buildings are critical of all shapes and sizes. We know that in many parts of the world, buildings are built largely through informal activity. They're not governed by building codes. So when you look at buildings and informal infrastructure, there's a massive challenge in trying to actually be able to invest to improve the quality and standards that are there to make them more, more robust. And then of course, and COVID remind, reminds, that of, uh, reminds us of that every day, uh, if you don't, I, I adequate, don't have adequate health infrastructure, especially in, in rapidly growing cities where you have primary, secondary and tertiary health care. And, and of course, uh, like we've seen in COVID, a whole range of other infrastructures um, that, um, that provide us uh, you know, uh, the basic systems of surveillance, uh, we're not able to go f very far without that. And of course, as we have an SG4 committed to education across the world, educational infrastructures are critical, especially uh, in places where there are lots of young people. Uh, and we need to be able to build educational infrastructure that is not only accessible, but we've seen again and again in multiple flood events and earthquakes uh, that, that will actually protect young people and their educators in those environments. And finally, because cities are not only places in which we work and do economic, you know, are engaged in economic activity, cultural and heritage institutions are very critical. In, in fact, most of our cultural heritage um, uh, is in sort of both in living and other form in, in our urban centers. And significant losses of that, in a sense, are very critical to trying to deal with larger development questions. So I've laid out this kind of large, um, let's say, uh, canvas to give you a sense of the scope of these infrastructure systems. Of course, some of them are what we call lifeline infrastructure. So when something really hits us, they're the ones that become more important. And of course, sometimes we only look at you know, particular sets of things. So uh, let's say if you're looking at earthquakes and or we're looking at, uh, at, at storm surges, we're looking at infrastructure that, that will enable to protect us, that's there. So let's say uh, cyclone shelters or evacuation routes. But in actual fact, the same place could be impacted by, uh, by an epidemic. So you do need to have the health infrastructures that actually ma map onto those spaces. So we have to provide a comprehensive set of engagements with these questions. Of course, we have to choose and sequence them because in many parts of the world, we do not have the resources to try and address all of them simultaneously. And that's the reason why good disaster risk management, good disaster risk planning is very critical because in a sense, the interesting thing about risk is it's often very concentrated, not only physically, but around particular hazards. And if one gets a good sense of that, then I think it's a lot easier for us to be able to plan more effectively. So I guess the, the next operational question is, how can we implement disaster risk reduction in urban areas? You know, the advantage in urban areas are a lot of people or many people are concentrated in a particular location. So in some senses, being able to access them rather than dealing with terrains in which people are, you know, widely dispersed in mountain areas or, you know, in, in, in large sort of forested areas, the concentration helps. But the important thing to understand here is that, you know, we talk about uh, natural hazards in some sense, but in, in actual fact, in many ways, I mean, though uh, many of these things may not be within human control, like an earthquake or a landslide in some senses, much of risk is actually constructed. And the reason I'm saying it's constructed is in, in many parts of the world, it's about vulnerability. It's about, you know, how vulnerable your buildings are, how vulnerable your society is, how vulnerable your economic systems are. And those are tied to economic and development choices that we're making every day. And in fact, the wonderful thing about the sustainable development goals is that there is a system that tries to address in, a, in effect vulnerability right across the development spectrum. So risk is actually constructed. It's constructed because we reproduce it uh, from sector to sector. We often reproduce it from, uh, from generation to generation in, in, in some senses because of inequalities of wealth, inequalities of income, and you know, like many of us know from our own life experience, COVID has really shown us that very, very critically. So I, I guess the first thing in some sense is for a particular place, you know, it could be a region because very often we're looking at urban systems or you know, a town or a city, we need to unbundle the hazard risk. We need to know what are the things that are most probable uh, over let's say a 50 or hundred year period, depending on you know, whether you're looking at a house or an infrastructure. Infrastructures very often last uh, at least 30 to 50 years. Some of them last hundred years. Uh, so you need to unbundle them into those that are hydrometeorological, basically is a fancy word for saying, you know, drought and flooding, stuff to do with rainfall and, and, and snow and a whole range of other things like that. It's, uh, these things that are driven by weather in some senses. Seismotechnotic is another fancy word to talk about. Earthquake, volcanoes in some parts of the world, uh, and of course landslides as, as we go into areas which are fragile, ecologically sensitive areas. 
technological risk, which I will not spend much time about, but you know, the technological risk is, is very severe. If uh, those of you who remember the Fukushima, um, you know, meltdown in some senses where uh, we had deep systemic risk, a tsunami came in and impacted uh, critical infrastructure, in fact, uh, a few nuclear power plants that led to its own challenges. So technological risk is something that's a very significant thing from chemical accidents, etc. I will not deal with that today. That's a more complex topic. Uh, health, of course, we all know about at the moment, uh, especially in the question of, 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 of epidemics and more particularly the question of conflict. People often don't recognize this, but urban areas historically have actually become cauldrons of or places that concentrate conflict, especially when inequality becomes significant, whether it's economic inequality or social inequality. So when we're dealing with the risk, we need to look at the profile of the place that we're talking about, the systems, the buildings, the infrastructure in that context. So unbundling is quite critical because then you can prioritize, then you can try and deal with, you know, what comes first and what comes later, where you actually organize your capacities and, and, your, uh, uh, and your investments. But when you start implementing it, I guess the most important heuristic here, and, and those of us who've been doing this for a while, and I imagine some of you have been doing that, at least in my experience, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, but the, the, I would say the most critical and, and most operational question is, how do you reduce vulnerability? You know, The simple one, of course, is buildings because they're physical objects, but most vulnerabilities sit within social systems. It sits because people don't have ac access to adequate jobs. Uh, they may be living in places that are unsafe because you know, they don't have tenure rights. They don't actually have infrastructure access in some cases. So vulnerability reduction, raising the floor of basic services, education, healthcare, water, sanitation, uh, you know, access to basic infrastructure. That's kind of something that I would say would cut across most places, especially places in the global south, where this is an endemic challenge because of the nature of development that we have. Inequality, uh, not enough resources to be able to deal with these kind of things, and a large number of people who are struggling to survive uh, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis and live in, in, in circumstances without adequate protection and security. The second thing, of course, is to reduce exposure. And that's kind of, you know, obvious. If you're living inside a floodplain, you shouldn't live there because at some point of time, especially because of climate change, a 100-year flood will become a 50-year flood or a 50-year flood will become a 10-year flood. And you would get flooded out and, you know, may, you may lose your life, which is very unfortunate, or you'd almost certainly lose your possessions. So there are some places in which people shouldn't live or at least if they live there, they have to be strengthened and they have to be protected. And this is a big debate uh, about, you know, what's more effective, are nature-based solutions more effective, or do you really have to reorganize and rebuild cities? And in some cases we may find in the next 20 or 30 years, as climate change really becomes much more significant, that we have to pull back the, the frontiers of some urban areas. Uh, uh, we may have to even relocate them because not everybody can do what the Dutch have done and in a sense built a country uh, which is surrounded by dikes because that requires tremendous engineering innovation, but it requires a lot of resources in some senses. The other critical question, of course, for us is to build adaptive capacity. And, and a lot of this is in a sense, softer kind of things that are there. Uh, how do communities actually deal with and address with questions? And I think, you know, the classic example of that is how Bangladesh very effectively over a 30 or 40 year period, even though it did not have much financial resources, dramatically reduced its, um, uh, its risk and the impact and certainly death and also loss of life uh, by building uh, community-based uh, resilience, uh, community-based disaster risk response systems, and of course, early warning and monitoring systems, which are very critical, especially in short onset uh, events, uh, like, you know, like a cyclone or earthquakes are a little bit more difficult to try and deal with in this space, uh, or a storm surge for that matter. And in some cases, we're trying to do that in tsunamis too. Uh, and then finally, you know, if you're really, if you have a lot of resources and uh, you really have uh, you no know, other options, then you would probably go for hazard modification to try and make sure that you have seawalls that protect your cities, um, that you have a whole range of technical arrangements that can actually work. But I mean, there is a little bit of bad news here. Many years ago when, you know, we, in the last IPCC cycle, we were looking at urban resilience uh, we looked at, you know, large cities like New York and London and also smaller cities like uh, Dar es Salaam and, 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 and let's say Durban. And what we found is in the latter part of the century, assuming that we're not successful in massively reducing uh, emissions, there isn't much difference between, uh, you know, a city like London, which has this fantastic, you know, it's been there for a long time, um, the Thames Barrier, which uh, is a remarkable feat of engineering to deal with local flooding, of course, but also as in as a long-term sort of protection against uh, against um, uh, 
uh, sea level rise and of course storm surge that will happen. Effectively, because we may see temperature uh, rises of up to two and a half to three degrees above the pre-industrial average, uh, it doesn't really make a difference in some senses, uh, whether you're a rich city or a poor city. Once the ecosystem services start collapsing, you might have a 10 year difference between one and the other. And I think that's, that's not really good news. Planners don't think about this stuff, but we need to address these questions. And finally, you know, like I, I gave the example of Fukushima, uh, we have uh, the ability just now in the world because things are connected. And this is what happened in COVID um, that you risk can start in one location and then it can propagate very quickly one risk leading to the other in Fukushima, tsunami leading to flooding, leading to an impact on, on, on the nuclear power plant, which then had a huge uh, impact on people uh, sitting around that. Or like we saw in COVID, uh, a particular risk starts in one location, but can very quickly uh, spread across uh, other parts of the world. And you know this is an urban phenomenon in some senses. Um, so you know, I, I, I'll skip this, um, this, this slide. It basically, like I said earlier, there are you know, six different characteristics that are important. Uh, you need to have reflective systems that can respond to an uncertain future because that's a very important part of what we're de dealing with. The good news, of course, is many parts of the world still a lot of the urbanization gets is yet to happen. So if we actually do the right thing this now, it's not only going to be cheaper, it's also going to become more resilient. But we have to look ahead, think ahead, and not you know look just just at what we can see in front of our nose. These systems have to be robust. Uh, you have to have well conceived and constructed physical assets. Yes, we run in say I talked about that earlier. This is a little a difficult thing to do in, in places that are resource constrained. You have to have both resourceful people and systems. So we can kind of adapt to a very difficult and changing environment. Things have to be flexible because they need to adapt and change over time. You know, these are all system characteristics that come from ways of thinking and doing, which are not really, you know, functional in a world that's broken down into silos where some people build, build bridges, other people build, you know, things that protect the shoreline, but they don't match. And of course, then you have a big problem because eventually the hazard doesn't care about whether your bridge or your shoreline or your land use planning is not working. It'll still go and flood you in any case, right? Uh, of course, like I said, you know, these processes have to be inclusive and, and they have to be integrated to be able to bring together all of the elements that we're talking about at the moment. So I guess coming to how does one kind of operationalize this within the development frame that we had, uh, this is the sustainable development goals those of you who are familiar with them 17 of them which are agreed politically by all countries in the world and you know we're almost half the way through, through just now uh then i guess less than 4000 days now to, to to reach 2030 to try and implement these but there are two sets of things that <coughs> are important here the first thing and this is very important is the sdgs are a universal agenda meaning it doesn't matter whether you're a rich country or a poor country <coughs> you're a rich city or a poor one this is something that we're going to try and do for everybody. So that's a big shift in, in our ways of thinking. It's not only doing one thing at a time, it's doing all of these things at a time. And that's kind of a little bit complicated at one end, but in another end for people who manage these systems at urban scale, that's how it actually is. You have to have water and you have to have electricity uh, or let's say renewable energy for that. You have to have work and it all has to happen in one place. And even though government in many cases or even firms are siloed into particular sectors, in actual practice, our lives are integrated. So we need to bring all of these things together. This is the reason why we were able to convince the UN and you know, I was sort of quite deeply involved in that negotiation to create a new goal around sustainable cities and communities, which brings these ideas together, both in rural and in urban areas in place. Because the whole thing about urban resilience is how do you find how to sort of not only enable development in that place, but to make sure it can deal with the multiple shocks and stresses that we know are going to come. Now, a critical other idea, which is inside the SDG frame, which most people don't know about, is a commitment, <coughs> first to leave no one behind, which of course is about everybody everywhere, which essentially means that every country, every city in some senses, is a developing place. You could be a very high income city, uh, like Singapore, for example, which has got relatively low resilience as far as environmental considerations are concerned because it's an island, right? Or you could be sitting in a, in a, in a mountain city which has other considerations that are there. So basically it doesn't matter how rich or poor you are, on some element of the development goals, there are going to be deficits. And in a sense, when you have to build resilience, it's across these, let's say 15 of them. And of course, 16 and 17 are very important goals because they provide the institutional basis for all of this to happen. So the first idea is we need to leave no one behind, which basically means 
You have to address, like I said in the beginning, the most vulnerable first. The second thing, which is a, is a very interesting question that we often forget is, we need to leave no place behind. That is, we can't only focus on the metropolitan cities and forget the smaller ones because they're all tied together in an urban system, but also within a city, because there's so much of inequality between different places in a city, you have to think of the most vulnerable areas too at the same time. And finally, like I said earlier, if you do not address ecosystem services, you don't have food, you don't have water, you have bad air, you're certainly going to be in significant, significant trouble. And what you'll find is in effect, as we've seen in many parts of the world over history, those places will be abandoned. And we have a long history of urban abandonment, uh, you know, pretty much in every, every continent of the world. So this is SDG 11. And as you can see here, we consciously wrote into this, the idea of resilience. Um, that was a very radical idea at that point of time, but you can see why, why it's important. So you need not only to be inclusive, you need to be safe, uh, both at the individual and, and, and the city level, but these systems have to be resilient. And resilience and sustainability, in a sense, uh, go together quite, quite closely in some senses. So if you come and I sort of close with, you know, the, the, the core ideas of one of the most significant challenges we're facing, you know, obviously risks have been always there. Uh, cities have been, have been ravaged by fire, by earthquake, and in many cases, or war in some cases, they've come back. But climate is a little bit different because it's a global challenge like biodiversity is, and it's really going to make life very, very difficult in cities. And not only, it's, it's not only going to make life difficult in cities, we have to reimagine, I would say maybe 100 or 150 years of urbanization and how our economic systems actually work. So why is that important? Of course, because there are lots of people who are going to be in various places, but also because urban areas, this is an Im image of, of, of Rio de Janeiro, as you can see it, uh, which in the far and the, you know, the far background has some of the most expensive real estate in Latin America. But the bulk of the city lives in the favelas, which you can see in the, in the foreground, let's say. So basically urban land cover is increasing dramatically. Uh, and that's also having an impact on ecosystem services. So it's not only population growth and growth of density, but cumulative urban expansions, uh, which are becoming very significant, not only in their own footprint, but because they draw resources, they draw water, they draw demand for food from very, very large landscapes. So in some senses, uh, urbanization could be used as an opportunity, but we have to understand what I call its dark side, the fact that it concentrates poverty, inequality, conflict, and risk at the same time, not only jobs and you know, wealth creation and all the nice things that we associate with urban transition. So one of the deep insights that we had when we wrote the 1.5 report of the IPCC uh, a few years ago was to make this happen, you need to do four things simultaneously. The most obvious things is that you need to, you know, the energy system transition is critical. You have to move our fossil fuels, whether they're coal or oil or gas and move into renewables. Now, thankfully that is in many parts of the world, that's something that's happening uh, very rapidly and it's happening uh, almost on, on its own because you know the, the costs of let's say renewable power uh, from photovoltaics is actually de declining. The big challenge, of course, is many parts of the world people don't have access to electricity, so you need to electrify and you need to move to renewables because, as we know, for cities you can do wonderful things on your rooftop, but as long as you connect it to the grid and the grid is essentially using coal, you're not doing very much in terms of emissions as far as that's concerned. So there's a massive energy system transition that we're going to see over the next uh, you know. 10 or 20 years, where we're trying, many countries are targeting to become net zero by 2050, uh, which means going to, let's say, 45 to 50 percent uh, uh, emission reductions in the next 10 years, which is like a huge shift in the way things are going. The other thing that's going a little bit slowly is the industrial system transition. What does it mean in practice? It means dealing with concrete, steel, glass, and bricks. These, you know, the a very, very significant amount of energy, depending on where you're looking at, what kind of cities you're talking about, maybe anywhere between 15 to 30% of the total energy is actually in the built fabric of these cities. So unless we transform these systems of industrial production, it's not gonna make much of a difference. So this is a hard one because this is going rather slowly. So in a sense, you can't build up resilience uh, only by dealing with, with energy system transitions. You've also got to deal with what's actually going into the built infrastructure. And since these things will last for 50 years or hundred years, they're a massive opportunity to not only reduce the amount of energy, and hence the amount of carbon and other greenhouses gases that were created, uh, that were emitted, but also actually in some cases store carbon. And then of course, the big one, which is the urban and infrastructure system transition, which is not only about you know, the water and the energy, it's also about urban form. It is how dense our cities are. Are they walkable? Are they, uh, you know, how, how will they be configured? 
are we using much of our uh, our road space for cars which you know very few people are actually using when we should make it, make it available for public transit so a whole range of questions around planning and organization and then finally like i said do not think of cities as things that can stand alone if we don't look at land oceans and ecosystems we're in deep trouble and certainly you know in the next 50 50 years for sure maybe even before that uh, we're going to have to abandon or dramatically change the way the cities are actually working so i guess the question then is i've talked about many things you know i've talked about the fact that cities are growing and they you know in the in a sense a global economy uh, most of our societies are are situated around the change changes that are taking place through the process of urbanization and i've also said that these urban areas concentrate risk as they concentrate poverty which basically means that if you want to reduce risk in a country on a region you do also have to think about cities which are also unequal places and then we said uh, when we looked at those risks as far as that's concerned risks have to be addressed fundamentally by improving the development conditions of people by lifting the floor by making access to infrastructure by making access to services to places which are secure available to everybody that's what the sdgs are about and then we have this new big shock after covid and that is climate that's kind of creeping up on us and we have to really act very quickly so how do we bring together risk um, uh, resilience or what it was called disaster resilience climate resilience and the opportunity of being able to rebuild and in many cases retrofit our cities and and there's a lot of good experience in, around that so how does that make that happen i would say there are five or six big things that need to get done these are at the institutional level they don't necessarily happen uh, in you know individual houses or buildings or enterprises or our cities the most important one is actually Uh, what we call integrated multi-level governance basically you know if you want to try and deal with something at the city level you can do a lot of things at the city level if you're a mayor or if you're working in government or in a firm but some things actually critically depend on what happens in the region or the province and at national level for example if you don't have resources to be able to retrofit or strengthen your systems to set up early warning systems that have let's say radars to look at where storms are going to come from or boys that which give you a sense of you know is 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 there going to be a uh, significant sea level rise or tsunami etc those are infrastructures which are often a uh, best done and organized by national processes in some senses so there has to be a partnership between national government regional government and local government and this is an area which we have a lot of contests and a lot of debate across the world but in effect we've learned that from the sendai framework which is one of the most important sort of uh, developments that has taken place i would say in the last 20 or 30 years and that is there's a tremendous amount of bottom up action that's happening but if that is not supported by enabling processes and a governance frame that makes sure that resources that people that technologies that innovation can actually work from national level all the way down to local level uh we have a real challenge and this is a i would say universal problem pretty much across the world that this relationship the vertical relationship between government and national and local level is not where we want to take it and i think there's a lot of innovation that's got to be uh, you know enabled in that space to to make this happen you need adequate legal and regulatory frameworks and this is a bit of a challenging area you need to have a national urban policy that talks to uh, a disaster risk reduction policy that talks to a climate uh, resilience or climate action policy they have to talk to each other now typically they don't talk talk to each other because these are hosted in different ministries and departments of the government for example uh and you know to to make that happen is really very difficult uh places where this has been successful have had either integration in let's say the office of the prime minister of the country or the president that brings all of these things together because if these conversations if the resources if the actions if the legal and regulatory frameworks don't come into place you find all kinds of you know insane things i mean i've seen them over many many years in various places you find a steel plant that's been built with let's say or a, or a refinery with a billion dollars of investment sitting in an area that we know is going to be flooded that we know is going to be impacted by an earthquake because different sets of government were thinking about different things right now to address this we have to build institutional capacity and i would say most critically at the local level because municipalities small towns especially and even large larger met metropolitan cities this is one of the biggest gaps that we have most of the resources is are concentrated in you know in innovative firms large government etc they're not at the place where we need it to actually deal with this kind of challenge and i think this is an area where a lot of innovation has happened in the world when we have more time to talk we can talk about particular cities and regions where this stuff has happened basically we need the institutional capacity we need people who are trained we need people who can think across these kind of questions because they are the people who will make the institutional change and make things happen and of course none of this will work unless you have more money now that means that the financing system has to be 
completely reworked, uh, both for the climate finance side uh, and also for the disaster risk side. It doesn't require a whole, I mean, an immense amount of resources, but it does mean that you have to prioritize this. And it does also mean that you have to prioritize this now. If you want to, 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 to achieve the sustainable development goals by 2030, and you're going to be knocked you know, every few months in some parts of the world by some risk of you know, massive uh, hazard impact uh, you know, month after month. And the Philippines, I think this year has been hit by, uh, I don't know, maybe a, a dozen or more uh, different events. Uh, the critical thing is to be able to make sure the resources flow from the right places at the right time and they go to the right things. And frankly, we do not have an architecture that actually works in many parts of the world. There's innovation that's happened here and there, but this is a thing whether you're rich or a poor country or a, a rich city that, that, that people really struggle with. And finally, we have tremendous opportunities around um, technical and social innovation. Uh, that's what's really making a big difference as far as we're concerned. And that's in a sense, uh, something that we're trying to kind of work on. So, you know, if I just take the climate resilience story and I'll close with, with this slide, uh, effectively there should be enough resources there, but in actual fact, we have to change around the systems of ways of working. So effectively what we're saying is, this is not just you know, millions of dollars of investments or whatever it is in the currency that you're in, this is actually reworking how the economies and functioning of infrastructure and systems are going to work across the world. Uh, and and effect, effectively at, at the bottom line, this cannot be done only by governments. This has to involve a new set of partnerships. It means reworking, in a sense, the global financial system so that we don't invest in things that are not resilient, absolutely, or those things that are actually going to take us uh, you know, down the road to, to a disaster as far as climate is concerned, whether it's you know, coal-fired power plants or fossil fuels. So you move resources away from that and into things which we know are going to be resilient over the medium and the long run, um, and uh, which basically means redirecting how things are actually uh, done. So finally, I guess, uh, you know, why is CDRI important? CDRI is important because CDRI is uh, the coalition that's taking these questions absolutely face on uh, across, you know, many, many countries across the world, irrespective of whether they're rich or poor, uh, whether in the G20 or otherwise, because without conversations happening in different parts of the world, without learning how we can improve infrastructure, deal with informality in, uh, in the cities where, which are growing uh, dramatically or dealing with uh, climate resilience, uh, even high income countries are going to be severely challenged without that. So this is uh, a way for us to bring together both infrastructure and urban development, address questions of uh, conventional disaster risk, but also climate risk in, in, in one frame and using evidence, technology, innovation, financing, uh, and the best lessons that we have, which we're learning, literally, I would say every month from across the world to apply them to help the most vulnerable, uh, the low income countries, uh, the LDCs in some cases, uh, in, in some parts of the world, and of course, also others who have a lot of risk um, at stake. So I'll stop there and uh, I'm happy to jump into the, I'm going to stop sharing, uh, happy to jump into the chat and see how we're doing on this. Um, great. Thank you so much, uh, Ravi. Uh, if possible, uh, there are, if you have 10 minutes more or at least six minutes more, if we can pick up a few questions that you think relevant, that would be nice. Great, good, thanks so much. Um, yeah, I'm just going to run through the questions just now. Uh, I'm happy to run over if you people are willing to stay on a little bit longer. Okay, so the first question that I have on the list uh, from Samir Deshkar about climate action seen at business opportunities. So, you know, yes, climate action, see, thing is like this, we have to transform uh, the energy system, for example. Now, part of that will be, will be done through, you know, active economic activity. The reason, for example, the solar PV power is becoming more effective in many parts of the world is because it's become cheaper at the margin, at the, even at the marginal price level than uh, then, 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 then uh, let's say coal-fired power. So you, you really have to be able to uh, keep the balance between uh, innovation and economic activity, uh, and what you 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 you're concerned here about uh, about citizens and what they're doing. So the demand side is very critical. If we choose to use less water, if we use to choose to use less energy, and for example, uh, by you know choosing to use the right kind of devices, changing all our light bulbs by using public transport. Obviously, it makes a big difference because there are 8 billion of us on the planet, maybe you know, almost 5 billion who are going to be living in cities. If we're able to keep our consumption lower uh, without necessarily dramatically influencing uh, 
uh, the quality of, of life that we have because we can do with much less in some senses. And that's what technological innovation is about. Um, so Mariette from the chef has very interesting question here about ecosystem services. So uh, there are lots of examples of, of restoration. I, you know, I, the most obvious one, of course, and the most difficult one I think is, is dealing with coral reefs, but even in coral reef restoration, which is now starting to happen in many parts of the world, um, the relationship between the city uh, and what it consumes and the reef is very important because in some ways, coral reefs not only protect uh, the environments that we're living in uh, as far as uh, islands are concerned, but they're the places that provide us not only you know, the, the uh, nurseries for fishing, which is critical in some cases for livelihoods, but that's what brings, uh, you know, that's what brings tourists which, uh, who are becoming more, more and more important in some island economies to keep things going. So it's absolutely critical. Uh, and I took the example of coral, coral reefs because that's one of the most dramatically uh, endangered, um, what we call uh, sort of key risks as far as climate is concerned. We can see 95% of them under being uh, under severe kind of impact. Similarly for mangroves, for example, which are very critical. They take time to be able to regenerate, but I've myself seen and been part of mangrove regeneration, also building shelter plantations to deal with um, you know, both storm surge and, and, and wind impacts. So these things are, are fairly well known. We do need to learn how to be able to deploy them in scale and change people's orientation towards ecosystem services. Uh, and you know our relationship with nature, and I guess many indigenous uh, cultures have a have a have a have a reverence for for nature, which we have to try and bring back as far as that's concerned. Um, but then, yes, I guess the the entire set is going to be available for you. We're very happy to share that. Uh, I can also uh, I mean, we're happy to put stuff into the chat where you can access a range of other resources as far as that's concerned. I'm going through the Q and A first, and then we'll come to the chat in some ways. Uh, how does one improve urban resilience in, in, in informal settlements? That's a really hard question. I would say if, you know, if, obviously it depends on city to city and uh, let's say informal settlement in some informal settlement. I would say one of the first and most important things we've learned across the world is you need to give people tenure security. That's absolutely critical. When people have tenure security in places that are safe, they will not live in, 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 in particular locations which are exposed to flooding or drought or X and Y and Z. So first thing. The second thing is, uh, access to universal access to services, especially water and sanitation, electricity are very critical and they immediately start improving the resilience of, 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 of everyday life. It's kind of obvious to whoever we're talking about that. Say. And it's not only that today, the internet in some ways has become a, a way of life. You know, when you don't, don't have schools running and, you know, everybody's uh, going to class uh, using sort of remote access whenever they have access to it, the internet becomes like a critical infrastructure in some senses. And obviously buildings, but Buildings uh, and the investment you can make are, are tied to the kind of uh, culture that you have there in terms of resources. Uh, and that's one place where a lot of local innovation becomes effective. But again, the critical question is, uh, things that may be, seem cheaper at the moment may be actually really problematic in the long run because they're deeply carbon and energy intensive. And that's a, that's a difficult question in some places because uh, informality in some senses uh, draws into it solutions that are not necessarily uh, let's say energy energy conscious and some or energy sensitive uh, for no no fault of the people who are living in those settlements but because in a sense that's the only thing that they can access because it's a mass produced material uh, and because fossil fuels are so highly subsidized or not um, yeah so yeah, there's one of the slides that Carlos was asking the question uh, you know so there are a whole range of different urban resilience assessment frameworks there was a slide that I missed, which was put, we put together by, by my colleagues and friends uh, who look at different characteristics of urban resilience. I think one thing that's important to understand is we often focus on the physical side because that's easy to deal with. But uh, most of the learnings that we had, even in, in, you know, in, in high income locations, look, look at what happened to New York during Sandy. It is a community-based resilience. That's, uh, it is a social infrastructure that often is the most important thing that you're dealing with. You know, you're cut off from the rest of the world. You may be uh, in, in, in one of the richest cities in the world, which controls the, the global markets. But effectively, if you don't have food uh, and if people in your neighborhood are not, not willing to share and, and, and share that or, or, or light or whatever it is, uh, very often, I would say uh, it is the software elements as we, as, as we talk about it, the, the capabilities that are very critical to making them happen. And you know, we, we're getting to understand those kind of choices a little better and better. Um, Dharam from Kathmandu. Well, planning is very critical. I mean, you've seen this uh, in, in what happened around the, uh, the Gorkha earthquake in, in Nepal. Uh, 
I mean, my last visit that's uh, looking at what, you know, how the rebuilding is taking place in many, not only in, in Kathmandu itself, but outside, uh, planning is absolutely critical. And I think the challenge for us uh, in cities that have grown over time is uh, it, it becomes, and where informality is very critical, is to effect planning in a rational manner becomes, at least physical planning in a rational manner becomes difficult. So you really have to use a whole range of other resources at your, at your, at your disposal, include, including dealing with a whole range of social processes, including uh, setting up social safety nets. People naturally don't want to go into situations in which they're at risk, right? They're forced to do that because their livelihoods depend on that. Uh, you know, the kind of access they have to services depend on that, or they're migrants into the city they don't have the money to be able to stay in places where they know they're going to be safe. So being able to plan for changes and expansion, being able to be open to land use and fundamentally sort of in some cases, uh, questioning how land markets create inequality is something that we need to look at. This is kind of, you know, this is on the border of, of a very difficult conversation, but frankly, when we're dealing with risk, we have to address these kind of challenges as far as that's concerned. Um, Cristobal from, from, from Mexico. Yes, of course. I mean, the, you know, obviously uh, uh, prevention is, is, is the beginning of process. The question is, what can you prevent? Basically, what, what I'm saying is you have to address vulnerability uh, uh, and that vulnerability is very critical. Of course, you know, you, you can prevent people being impacted by an event because you have an early warning system. They can be evacuated. They can know what's happening. Uh, you know, my own sort of little experience of what happened with that massive earthquake that took place in Mexico City now almost 40 years ago is it is really uh, the vulner reducing vulnerability that actually made the big difference. And uh, I had a, a colleague of ours and we worked a lot on this kind of question. I think the, 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 the responses, especially from cities of the global south, uh, should focus on vulnerability. And in effect, development uh, and universal access and effecting the, the sustainable development goals is the most effective way of prevention in some senses, right? Uh, it's not only about putting investment into hardening things, it's about people and what they do and how they actually work it. And of course, you're right about the fact that multi-hazard responses involve making difficult choices. That's why science and, and systematic hazard and vulnerability analysis, multi-dimensional assessments are important. We have the knowledge of how to do this in many parts of the world. We just need to make local governments work on this. And I think Latin America has been remarkable in this in the last 30, 35 years that I've seen it. Uh, some of the most remarkable innovations have come uh, from Latin America and Central America in this place. So we really have learned from other places uh, like in Asia from, from Latin American experiences and Central American experiences. Um, yeah, I guess security is a very important question. In some senses, you know, when we were debating the, the sustainable, this is from uh, Marcial uh, in, in Guatemala, um, uh, one of the most important concerns that many mayors whom I, who I've worked with in, in many parts of the world, especially those that are in conflict or post-conflict situations, have said, you know, security for us is the most important question. So, for example, I take the particular example of a city like Rio before the Olympics. Uh, the, the, the single most important question that I think the mayor of Rio was trying to deal with at that point of time, before where the Olympics facilities were going to be set up, uh, you know how their uh, rapid uh, the their the bus systems are going to be set up, etc. Their met their their transit systems was the question of of, of security, uh, and security is deeply connected to questions of 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 uh, of, uh, of infrastructure and informality. I mean, uh, Medellin is a wonderful example of that. I was there just before COVID hit, and that's a city where you can see how the structure of the city is is has been critically uh, you know related to to the questions of security and conflict. Uh, and how they've dealt with that by doing a whole range of things, in, including uh, universal access to services, the library systems, you know, community-based processes that are there to make things uh, different. So if a city like Medellin could actually transform its future, I think there's a hope for, for many of us in other places. But of course, you know, why should you get as far as Medellin or you know, other cities that we're seeing, which are deeply divided for, for a whole range of other questions as far as it's concerned? Uh, yes, GLOF is a critical question. We've just had a major I mean, it's not, it's, it's at the border of a GLOF event um, in, in India, and you know, it's, it's a very critical thing, especially in mountain regions. Um, this is something that requires, uh, obviously, early warning in some senses. It requires, and I've worked in mountain regions myself, it requires some really hard questions. In some cases, you do need to relocate. Uh, almost uh, 30 years ago, we were involved in significant relocation in the Himalayas, which I think has been in, in the region that was uh, near, near the region that's been, that's been affected. So, of course, GLOFs are critical. And as Gleason Met is going to increase over time, uh, 
especially uh, in you know in areas where they're critical, whether it's the the Andes or uh, some parts of uh, of 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 Europe uh, and 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 North America, and certainly in the in the Kush region, this is going to be a big risk as far as it's concerned. So, so social vulnerability. See the whole thing about sustainability. Sustainability is not only about the environment; it's also about economic and social sustainability. So inequality in social structures is one of the most critical challenges that we are facing at the moment. And you know, that's what COVID is about just now. If you look at the relative vulnerability in, in even in rich cities of the world between people who have access, who have privilege, uh, people who are of, of, of color, et cetera, there's, there's stark differences as far as that's concerned. So social vulnerability in many parts of the world is probably the most significant one, in some cases more important uh, than, than economic vulnerability and then physical. So, this depends on the context and even within a city, uh, social vulnerability may be the more important thing to focus on in particular locations, depending on what the context is. Uh, you know, if you, ha you have a city that's really uh, in, in a deep contest because uh, let's say, you know, the drug cartels have become very important in that city, then questions that relate to social and economic questions are, are probably more important than uh, in, in the short term context there may be an earthquake in some senses. Resilience in informal in settlements, I've dealt with that a little bit. Um, this, is a, this is a hard question, but I would say go with communities first, you know, deal with questions of safety. They're absolutely critical, improve service levels. And of course, you have to increase voice. The reason that places are informal is because people don't have a voice in decision making. So your governance systems are really important to make that actually work as far as it's concerned. Um, uh, Katie from Stockholm, 16 is absolutely critical. You cannot do anything without 16. I didn't put 16 into that list because 16 and 17 are absolutely essential conditions. In fact, we call them, you know, the, the critical SDGs that define how everything else is put together. If you do not have peace, uh, we were just talking about conflict. If you do not have strong institutions, none of this is possible to try and implement. So uh, in some senses, they are sort of the ring that holds everything else together in, in some ways. So of course, 16 and 17 are very, very uh, critical for this. Uh, you cannot have societal uh, transitions without these institutions that actually uh, underpin that. So I'm, I'm sort of really running over time, but I'm trying to run through these things as quickly as I can. Uh, Akbar from Singapore. Oh, you've got a lot of questions here. Um, that, okay, aging populations. Yes, of course, aging populations are very critical. Uh, we do need to segment, you know, human populations and even economic activities by uh, what kind of vulnerabilities they have. So it's not only older people, and we're seeing this with COVID, but also younger people, if it's something else that we have to deal with. So uh, in a sense, vulnerability has to be looked at across its multiple dimensions. And like we've just said just now, uh, you know, a social lens is very critical to understanding vulnerability because most of the, and you know, gender is uh, underpins, I would say most forms of vulnerability in most places. And it's, it's silent in some ways. Again, if you're looking at violence that's erupted um, during COVID, we can see, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, critical, elements as far as that's concerned. Um, okay, so yes, so Gaurav is from, from Kathmandu is talking about, you know, what he's talking about there is, I've listed 10 systems and of course, policymakers uh, in, in many parts of the world are focused on physical things because they're easy, they can, are tangible. Uh, if they're politicians, it helps their, uh, let's say their re-election re sometimes because they can show tangible outputs. But the softer things in the long run are critical, remember, urban systems live for a long period of time, right? If you've destroyed your, your, your cultural heritage, in a sense, you have nothing to relate to. And I think this is the reason why the restoration uh, in some senses and the um, retrofitting and strengthening of not only what's happening in the center of Kathmandu, but in Bhaktapur, for example, to take a particular uh, example from the Kathmandu Valley is very critical because in a sense, the identity and the social references and also the historical understanding how how people have address questions of, of, of resilience to earthquakes sits in those environments because eventually it's about people. So if you're not, if people don't have references to deal with their everyday life, uh, you know, how can you build resilience in a society that doesn't have any anchors in some, in some ways? So uh, I think the soft sides are much more difficult and tangible to deal with, but uh, in some ways they may be the easiest way in to go in and mobilize and try and address these questions as far as that's concerned. Uh, hazard modification, hard question from Mariette. Sorry, I'm you know, there are lots of questions in the chat, <coughs> but I'm going to do the Q&A at the moment. Uh, some, some cases you actually have to do that. I mean, if you have a critical in infrastructure, like for example, an airport, and you know, for good or bad reason, 
you've 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 built that airport in a flood plain or you built that in a, in a coastal plain this has happened in many places across the world people who build airports you know have forgotten sometimes that the things like climate change that are going to happen you may absolutely want to 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 actually uh you know build dikes around the airport because uh if you want to actually bring in food fuel etc cetera, etc cetera, and the city is maroon that may be the only way to actually do it similarly for other kinds of infrastructure as far as that's concerned but these are often very expensive options the better thing would be to site things properly to try and uh, use nature based solutions so in many cases depending on what the context is uh, uh you you could actually use you know mangrove plantations shelter belts to deal with that you can actually grade what's happening use nature in in sensible ways uh and you know airports are a wonderful sort of uh sort of songs to human innovation and technology in some senses but if you can't land the aircraft it doesn't help you very much and remember they are very very energy intensive uh you know the airports in london actually probably uh because they they global hubs uh, consume a very significant proportion of, of the amount of energy that london consumes so there's also the question of saying can we make the airports greener and that's easy to do they have a lot of land so you can do a lot of solar pv but can you make air tr air transport uh move to biofuels that's a very hard question which is not so easy to address so yes of course um well of course there are some countries that have been able to bring together urban development and disaster risk reduction i mean you know historic people have looked at japan and and found as as a country that has tried to do these two things together but even a country like japan has struggled as we've seen in 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 fukushima so uh and there are countries like like i give the example of bangladesh in some senses that has been able to do that i would say maybe not so much in 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 the in the urban context but in the regional development context latin america uh, especially uh, really interesting examples that come out of um, uh uh peru out of colombia mexico has also done a lot of interesting things as far as it concerned costa rica has done both greening and um you know a more balanced urban development uh south africa is trying to do interesting things in various places but it's struggling in other on other cases um so nicoletta um so yeah i mean in in some senses poorer and richer is just one axis of the process fine because you can be you can be rich and you can have really no sort of social resilience and have no have, have no social safety net and you can see that i mean homeless people in in very rich cities are in very especially in 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 cold climates are in a desperate situation in some senses um so poverty is just one element in in i mean or resource richness is in some element you can you can make up for a lot by having uh, you know a, a lot of social support in in a whole range of processes but eventually people have to live so they need physical infrastructure they need buildings to live in that are safe uh, they need opportunities for jobs which give them the ability to be able to afford to live in those places uh so these are integrated questions as far as that's concerned but social social systems are, are are very important and i think we have to think of different ways of dealing with these questions in in cities of the global south that have relatively low incomes high levels of informality and rapid systems of urban growth and we have to be careful just now because sometimes people try and take examples from particular parts of the world uh which they worked in and they work very well but if if the income of those places are 10 times or 50 times what you have you're different you're living almost on on different continents in some senses so our solutions for these problems have to be different from the questions of retrofitting uh the infrastructure for high income uh, countries in in some ways um dheeraj joshi from tokyo yeah i mean you know there are many different definitions for urban resilience don't take things too literally but essentially what i was saying is focus on vulnerability because if you are able to deal with the bottom line in some senses with the poorest and most vulnerable people that's the test of whether your system is going to be resilient or not otherwise what will happen is you will go into a cycle of increasing vulnerability and that will lead to an urban breakdown which you may not see today but eventually will make your urban system of that particular city uh unattractive for people to live in uh, it will be you know Uh, the social breakdown leads to conflict and that conflict basically destroys economic activity so if if you should, if you don't deal with these questions so in that sense that that was a rhetorical kind of definition in some senses so of course urban vulnerability is a composite of all of these things physical social economic and environmental vulnerabilities absolutely there's a large literature in this uh, the global assessment of risk over the last many years has been dealing with this question uh, and so as you know uh, other places the sendai framework if you if you have access to it actually tracks and you know looks at these processes in various uh, uh places etc uh, urban abandonment well i mean uh, 
You, if you go back into history, you can find that in every continent. You go back to what's in, in the center of Iraq, the, the first big cities of the world, Ur, Nineveh, etc. Some of them are destroyed by, by war, but others are destroyed because the environment no longer can support them. Um, you know, in India, I can give you so many different examples of cities that were built, which were abandoned because, uh, you know, they were created by very powerful people, but they didn't have any water uh, or, you know, or, or they, 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 they were just uh, untenable economically. So urban abandonment has different connotations. This is a historical question. We have cities now in rapidly growing countries like in China, where, you know, the, the, within quotes, ghost cities, you built the city, but they're not enough people to keep them running. So uh, they don't actually run down. So urbanization has been around for 5,000 years. Uh, we haven't really solved some of these problems very well in, in many places. So look for places that have lasted for a thousand years and see what you learn from them. Uh, cities like, let's say, Istanbul, earlier Constantinople, a thousand years of, of engagement, uh, Varanasi in India. You know, there are many places that are like that or smaller places. We have a lot to learn from them and, and their, the balances that they have. The integration of urban and rural, this is Suja Rahman, is of course, I mean, that's very critical. What we are saying just now is, cities on their own have no viability. We have to look at the landscape. We have to look at, at regional questions. We have to look at urban systems in totality. Uh, of course, you have to break it down. If you make things too big and too complex, it's impossible to deal with them. Uh, yes, we have to look at urban questions in some cases. And I think one of the core questions we're going to deal with in the next 20 or 30 years is, you know, we talk about moving fossil fuels out of, of urban systems and, and, and global systems as far as it's concerned. Uh, but we forget that we're also not going to have fossil fuels that actually underpin the availability of, uh, of groundwater for irrigation and for fertilizer. So our food systems are going to be dramatically impacted by the move away from fossil fuels. So that's where the urban rural things are. I think we've kind of really, I'm happy to go on, but we've really run out of time. I think Priya is saying that, you know, we should probably wrap up. I can go on for a while. Uh, I'm still at maybe question, God only knows, 30 or something or the other. Uh, how do you want to handle this? I'm good to go for um, the next five or 10 minutes, but uh, we can close now, I'm, I'm good. And I haven't addressed all the wonderful things that I, I'm sure are happening in the chat. That's the advantage of only having one, one of us here and like whatever it is, a hundred of you on the other side. I want to really say, Aru, you've done a fantastic job with the questions. Like really, that's amazing. Thank you so much for taking so many questions. And thank you so much for, for uh, sharing so wonderfully, being able to map the global uh, commitments with urban uh, infrastructure. So thank you so much. And thank you. Uh, our audience has really been very good. Actually, we had a very, very small drop rate. I mean, there was just hardly one or two who dropped out. I mean, uh, they, but really, thank you so much. That means this was a wonderful uh, uh, session itself. The only few things I just want to make everyone aware because everyone is on the Urban Resilience Masterclass. One is every if everybody has uh, actually we have sent out mails through Prevention Web. It's a workspace, and a lot of them actually uh, go into the spam or the junk folder. So if you could just check it, so that you can uh, uh, log in and uh, use the the workspace by Prevention Web. The second uh, thing that I want to flag off is the next session which is on 18th March, is a part of the ICDRI, which is the global conference. And within the conference, one of the session is on urban resilience, and that is our next class. So I have uh, also put the, uh, the link on the chat box. If everyone registers for ICDRI, you'll automatically have access to the next class. And uh, so we have 4th March, 18th March, 1st April and 15th April. And we don't forget these dates. We log on on time. And uh, for all the postings, please uh, log in into the Prevention Web workspace, which everyone, who are, like all the registered participants have already gotten uh, access to it. And if we can continue the chat there. So once again, thank you so much, uh, Aramark. It, is, it was a great class. One, one last quick Quick response yes, to a, because this colleague from from Palestine. Yes. So I thought very quickly. Yes, the circular economy is very important. Uh, it's hard to implement in practice, but that's the way that we have to go. It's especially difficult in countries like yours and mine uh, because the level of development is such that resources may not be may, may not be easily available. So last question there. So thanks so much. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't answer everything that you asked, but uh, thank you, Priya. You've done a great job with the questions, Arun. Thank you so much. And uh, also want to thank...
DG Sandeep Pondrick of CDRI, whose uh, vision of uh, building capacities within countries and uh, and in within various professionals. So thank you so much. Yes.